Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Rajul Pandya Loj. I'm Director for Communications and Public Affairs here at IFPRI, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to this special event that we are jointly organizing together with the CGIR Research Program on Agriculture for Nutrition and Health, A4NH, and IFPRI. Special event is on food system transformations, national actions in a globalized world. Thank you for to those of you who are joining us here in person. It's a very cold day outside. Thank you for braving the elements. To those of you who are joining us online from around the world, and to those of you who will be watching this video in the days and weeks to come. We have a wonderful program lined up for you with great speakers. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to our super moderator. Our moderator today is Ruad Rubin, very well known to many of us. He is the research coordinator of food security, value chains, and impact analysis at Wageningen University, as well as an A4NH managing partner representative. Ruad, welcome. We look forward to having this event with you moderating. The diversity and improving the quality of diets, but also looking at environmental effects of the different production of uh, agricultural and food commodities, as well as the question of inclusiveness. Who has access to diets? Who, has, who are the producers of those agricultural commodities? And there might, might be many trade-offs between those topics, and those trade-offs trade -offs are typical for each of the countries. They are not generic, so that's why we want to go from today from a more generic understanding what is happening in food systems transformation, the change of food system, towards real country cases where this is happening and trying to illustrate a little bit those dilemmas. So the program is very simple. We start with a kind of setting the stage presentation by uh, Dr. Inge Brouwer. Uh, she is the coordinator of this program on food systems and healthy diets, which is part of the largest uh, CGR program, Agriculture for Nutrition and Health. Then we have two country uh, presentations, one on Nigeria and one on Vietnam. We are doing research in those countries, so we have quite some knowledge on the food systems over there. Then we have a panel discussion, three responses that try to guide us a little bit in how to deal with those dilemmas in concrete country situations. What can policymakers do? do? What can we do in terms of investments of public and private sector? And then finally, the floor is open to you. Uh, we will not have kind of question and answer. I hope that you will contribute to the ideas on how to deal with food system transformations in a globalizing world. So most welcome, Inge, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Ruert. So food systems um, have been and are actually key in the development strategies of many low and middle income countries especially to provide income jobs and employment for their populations. But these food systems are changing very rapidly due to global changes, um, urbanization, uh, population growth, climate change. And the worries about the present food system changes are actually also growing. Um, there are worries about the levels of malnutrition, undernutrition is reducing, but very slowly micronutrient deficiencies are still with us. And also obesity and overweight are actually increasing uh, very fast. So um, food systems at the moment are challenged um, to provide uh, and deliver nutritious food um, equitably uh, within the planetary boundaries. And to address these, we are convinced that country-specific approaches are needed. As country food systems are unique and depending on the natural resources that are available, the policy environment in the different countries, uh, the stages of development, uh, the social cultural uh, situation. So the focus on national level uh, food system seems to be very sensible. And of course, um, uh, there is a large link with uh, global changes um, in global food systems, as well as changes subnationally in urban areas and landscapes. But the actions to integrate these developments and to manage the different outcomes of food systems happens actually at national, uh, at country level, sorry. 
in the A4NH, um, we aim to guide these food system transformations towards healthier diets for poor population in a sustainable way. And in our work, we focus on four countries, which are Ethiopia, uh, Nigeria, uh, Bangladesh, um, and Vietnam. And I would highlight four priorities um, that are uh, comparable to these different countries. The first one is that we start with diet. Um, so we don't start as normally with production and supply of food, uh, but we start with diet because dietary transition needs urgent attention, meaning that we have to take care that people are consuming healthy diets, uh, meaning uh, balancing the healthy components of diets like fruits and vegetables, nuts and seeds, um, as well as reducing um, the intake of the unhealthy components. And then we talk about fat, sugar, um, and, and salt, for example. So these dietary transitions should be balanced um, with uh, the outcomes on sustainability. And most of the countries are not so much concerned about greenhouse gas emission, but they are much more concerned about the pressure on water, uh, the pressure on land, <coughs> as well as the cli climate adaptation that they are confronted with. And we realize that these type of transformations do need collaboration and coordination between many partners and does need um, enabling uh, environment and anchoring of food system thinking um, at national level and especially uh, linked to uh, policy priorities and policy developments in uh, national uh, countries. So, we are, in our program, we are introducing a simplified uh, framework uh, or version of the widely accepted uh, framework on uh, food systems uh, from the HLPE, the High Level Panel of Experts on Food Systems um, and Nutrition. And um, this framework is attractive because it puts dietary outcomes um, in the center. And it shows the different components of food systems, uh, like food environments, um, here, yeah, the food and the consumer behavior. So, why are consumers actually selecting their food? Um, it's focusing on food environment. Um, uh, from what environment? Where do they get uh, their food from? And it focuses on food value chains, where food production is part of it. Another element are the drivers um, um, that are driving changes in food systems as well as the different outcomes. So it's not only health, but it's also sustainability and socioeconomic uh, development. So as an illustration, um, 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 yeah, I, we depicted the, the, the food system transformations um, in, in, in four stages. So we characterize um, a, a more rural food system or sometimes called traditional food system. Um, a mixed food system or a transformational food system, then the urban food system, and then the last one we can call the food, uh, the future food system. That's actually the system that uh, we are looking for. And with this food system tra uh, um, uh, transformation, you see countries in different stages of food system transformation, but also within countries, you see different stages of food system transformation in different parts of countries. And with these changes in food systems, you also see changes in the food environment. So looking at the food environment in the rural food system, yeah, there's a, a dependence on wild food and cultivated food, um, and also on informal markets. But if you transform to more a mixed food system, you see the role of informal markets actually growing, while the role of wild foods um, is reducing or disappearing. And when going to urban food systems, you see that the formal market has much more um, influence in what people actually consume. And we are looking towards future food system where probably the formal market will reduce a bit and where cultivated markets in terms of having backyard gardens or home gardens, but also having farmer uh, markets become uh, more important. And with these transformations, you also see a transformation in, in diets, where diets are becoming actually more diverse, um, uh, but also higher levels of sugar, fat, um, and salt, where the cost of nutritious diets are actually changing, where safety is also, the safety risk is also increasing, and while we foresee that in future food systems, this dietary risk decline, diet quality improves, 
footprints reduce and costs um, also reduce. Yeah, and this is also related to the burdens of malnutrition and the footprints uh, that we um, expect. Um, in um, uh, had to, to have a meaningful uh, policy uh, decisions and policy strategy, um, you need data um, and information. And um, if we look at the availability of data on these different components, you see that it's a, a varying picture uh, between countries. So this is Ethiopia and Nigeria, where you see there's a lot of data available on agriculture production. Uh, but fair, there's very little information available on food environment. So there's a gap that we need to um, address. So reorienting thinking from demand side, um, uh, had to, uh, to, let's, from supply side to, um, to a dietary perspective, uh, we need much more data on the food environment and on consumer behavior than we have now. So in summary, um, a national food systems is an important entry point for improving sustainability, um, health and equity outcomes and a better understanding of where the knowledge gaps are and how small changes can fix these knowledge, gap, knowledge gaps um, are necessary and are a first step to reach our goal uh, to reach healthy diets for all. Thank you very much and thanks for sticking to the timing. Um, so this is uh, what we call backwards reasoning. Eh? So it starts with outcomes, diets, environment, inclusion, and then it reasons back to how to steer that process in terms of behavior of people, institutional environment, food environment, and also how the production and value chain are organized. Now this is very abstract. The figures in fact look like a toolbox for uh, Santa Claus in the Netherlands, eh? nice colors. Eh? But now we have to make it concrete. And we have two presentations from country cases. We start with uh, uh, Dr. Phong Hong Nguyen. She is from Vietnam and she works as a research fellow in the Poverty, Health and Nutrition Division here at IFPRI. And her focus, uh, that's most of her work is on the transition of Vietnamese food systems and the implications for both nutrition as well as safety and equity. And she will be immediately followed by Adam Bawalek Akende. Uh, he works uh, in IITA uh, as a senior scientist and he is an agrobusiness management expert who knows a lot about what's happening at the moment in Nigeria. So first, the floor is to Frank, please. Thank you. So I would like to share a little bit about the food system transformation in Vietnam. As you may also know that Vietnam is transformed very rapidly from low income to middle income countries. Poverty has reduced substantially. In parallel with that, undernutrition also reduced a lot for both mother and children. Just example in the figure here, we can see that Standing among children under five is reduced a lot, but it's still at 25%. Underweight among mother and children still at about 15%. And in parallel with that, adult uh, overweight obesity also increased together with the uh, chronic disease. Uh, next to that, we also see that anemia is still high and iron or other micronutrient deficiencies still affect a lot of population. Just example here, anemia is about 20 to 26 percent, depend on either rural or urban area, and zinc deficiency is affect nearly more than half of the population. So what Vietnamese people eat? We are a little bit well known for variety, for fresh, and for diverse. Whoever never been to Vietnam, we would encourage you to come to try our food. <laughs> so most of the food are very fresh. Example, you can see here the fish or the pork or the vegetable. It comes directly from the farm to the wet market and then to the kitchen and then to the table. So we are very little with the, all the processed or cold storage mm -hmm. food. But recently, there's very rapid dynamic change in the last decade. And here, I would like to touch on four main aspects of change. The first is agricultural production. In the past, we mainly focused on the rice production, but now it's very many diversity. Just example, we focus on more the exporting like coffee, rubber, cashew, 
And pork is also a big pro uh, production in Vietnam. It's the sixth largest producer of meat. Uh, currently, we're also in the rise of milk production. In terms of food storage and transport, like I said before, <laughs> we are preference is uh, fresh. So very little the process for storage or transport. Most of the food are, if it's for the export, we care, care about the, the cold chain for transport or for storage, but otherwise, it mainly in the domestic is fresh. So the issue with that is a lot of food loss or waste. Just example, with the vegetable, it's about 40, 40 to 45% of loss. All the seafood, about 30% of, of loss because of some process with not uh, stored well, so it, it, it becomes waste. Uh, the demand for the post harvesting technology has uh, increased uh, currently a lot. And in the south, with a lot of export companies, it increased. But in the north and a lot of more rural area, mountainous area, it's still a big issue. The third one is the food processing. So basically, we care about the fresh and the direct. So basically, only about 5 to 10 percent are food processed. So it's very baby, very infancy in the processing product. And in the past, only noodle and fish sauce is uh, considered with the processing. <coughs> Nowadays, more things are uh, got on the right, but it's still very low. Finally, in the food retailing and provisioning, basically mainly in the wet market. Currently, in the peri-urban and urban area, we uh, have a lot of supermarket or convenience store, but still, it's only in the urban or peri-urban area, not in rural, not in mountainous areas. And the culture of eating out also start to increase in several areas. So because of a lot of demand and then something new, so the food safety in Vietnam become a big concern. Here I want to show the three main examples for vegetable, for pork, and for seafood. For, that, for vegetable, the key concern is the pesticide. It, it, it immerses a lot and with the exit level of safety and also have some bacterial or parasitic infection. For the pork and the seafood, is the main issue is the overuse of bacteria or other uh, <coughs> growth promoter. And then in the pork, because most are the from the small farm and the pig are normally possessed in the small slaughtering, so there's a lot of issue about the hygiene. So what government have been done? So this emerging food system interest within the policy environment. The economic reform in the 90s is the main one that make Vietnam become from the import country to the export, the third export rise in the world. And after that, the agricultural restructuring in 2014 that make the supply oriented to be more like market responsive with sustainability, with more friendly with the environment and more move from the quantity driven to more quality. So it make it have a more name or more reputation in the international market. The global trade also emerging. Vietnam is uh, involved in several trade uh, agreements and remove several tariff, tariff barrier and also open door policy for several partners. Uh, currently, the Vietnam is very committed to the SDG2, it's a real zero hunger program. And several ministries led by the Ministry of uh, um, Agriculture have uh, committed to focus to work together to uh, achieve the SDG2. And in parallel with that, the National uh, of Nutrition together with Ministry of Health also have very detailed national action plan with several components with nutrition sensitive component to uh, support for that. Still, we have a lot of challenging in taking the problem. As we can say, the endless of like innovation technology, like of that, the limited scale and low quality of infrastructure, the lack of human resources and capacity and finance resources. And the most important thing is data. Data is very rare and, and not very transparent there. There's several data are collected, but not public based. So very lack of evidence for the policy advocacy or also for discussion. On top of that, Vietnam is very diverse, even it's very small country, but with eight ecological zones and 53 ethnic <coughs> minority. 
So there's still a lot of hot pocket with the poverty and the hunger in many areas. Plus with the long uh, coastal, so the climate change and disaster happened very uh, uh, recently and regularly. In terms of food safety, the government really pay much attention. Even the National Assembly is the one who stand up for food safety law in 2010. And below that, the government have several degrees. And then after that, the ministry have further have a guideline for implementing. But the problem is different ministry have a different own entity and the collaboration with them is not very strong. The knowledge about food safety is still very efficient and in terms of labeling, it's very, very uh, new in Vietnam. It's only voluntary. So basically, most of food because in the wet market, there's no labeling. And there's two issues with that. The producer who are not very motivated with that because it's very difficult for them to find the nutrition content to put in the food. And there's no system for them to estimate it themselves. In terms of the consumer, they are very familiar with the fresh market, so they don't really care about that. They don't have motivation to use that. Uh, there's a lot of challenge in application food safety in Vietnam. One is the capacity of government to control for that, and two is the surveillance system is still very efficient, in, uh, inconsistent and inadequate to monitor the large population and the food produced. And another one is the system of production is small and fragmented, and several small producers are not uh, registered with the government system, and they are not legally administrative as uh, inspiration, um, inspection. So therefore, they are missing a lot. And there's very high level of corruption. The level of transparency is very low there. And in case even some kind are uncovered, what is done after that is still is a big question. Yeah. So in summary, we can say that the food system transition is very rapid in Vietnam. It lost a uh, opportunity from the public system with the government, but still also a lot of challenges. And the two main one is uh, with the hot pocket in some underserved po population in rural area, in the uh, mountainous or in the ethnic ethnic minority, and also the food safety is a main issue everywhere, both urban, rural, and the peri-urban area. So it's very important to understand the food system interaction at multiple scale to identify the point to improve the food system. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. I think that was a very rich illustration that food security has a very food, a food safety dimension in your country and that institutionally it's very difficult to organize whether that should be given by the supply side with organization or with labels or whether perhaps there is other, other options also with incentivizing consumers to make better choices. So that gives a little bit already the dilemma. Thanks for this. Now we go to another country, another continent. Well, Nigeria is a, is a continent in itself, to be honest, because it's a, it's a country composed of different states. Uh, but it is a rapidly development in developing in different areas, in its markets, in its production, and also in its uh, health and, and nutrition dimensions, because we used to talk about Nigeria only as a country with let's say many people that were undernourished, but now there is also an increasing degree of people that are suffering from, uh, 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 from overweight and from obesity. So please, the floor is yours, Adebola. Nigeria is indeed a continent on its own. Huh? <laughs> um, I'll be speaking specifically about the Nigerian uh, context that's been earlier um, introduced. And I think uh, it's essential to um, uh, just give an introduction quickly as to the composition of Nigeria as a country, uh, because that is going to guide the uh, presentation going forward. Um, we also have the federal system of government, probably like the same way it's practiced in the United States. Um, so we, uh, we have the national government, we have the state um, government as well, around 32 states in, in Nigeria. Uh, but uh, uh, even though the regional governance is not pronounced, the reality is that the structure is there. So we have like around six geopolitical regions in Nigeria, uh, three in the south and three in the north. 
and this matters when we are talking about the issue of food system you know in Nigeria as we will see as we go along in the presentation so um, I, I won't go too deeply into the outline but just to mention that um, um, there are challenges there are opportunities there are risk and there are dynamics to food uh, system in Nigeria and to also uh, point out that there are multi-dimensional actors on the issue of food system within the country um, that we see quite strongly the relationship between the public and the private sector and what the development partners also can also engage in terms of food uh, system in Nigeria. And we also want to see what can we do going forward as a nation. So challenges of food system in Nigeria. Um, strongly there is a disjointed approach to food ecosystem from production to market. And this is not just a, um, a specific uh, regional based. It, is, it cuts across the whole of the country. Um, while you will uh, note that uh, some uh, region in Nigeria may focus strongly on production, some areas in Nigeria are very strong in terms of processing the market. Uh, for a good example, uh, if we use maize as an example of a, of a crop production in Nigeria, there is a production within, uh, for that particular crop is quite strong in the northeast of Nigeria, while the usage of that crop is actually very strong in the southwest of Nigeria. But much more that often, um, the relationship between the two is disjointed. Uh, those that are producing don't, don't know where the market is. And those that want the market don't know where they will be getting the product from. In addition to that, uh, there is a problem of rural urban nexus. Uh, there's a disconnected city. Um, in Nigeria, mostly we have uh, rural, we have the peri-urban and the urban as well. Uh, with the exception of Lagos State, uh, which is probably very popular among uh, non-Nigerian, um, who has a high population of uh, uh, highly urbanized uh, city uh, compared to most of the areas in, in, uh, in Nigeria. Um, every other state in Nigeria, a mix of peri-urban, urban, and, and rural. But there's no connection between these three areas uh, because of the dilapidated infrastructures um, over a period of time, especially in the rural area. So this um, disconnect is a major issue on the issue of food system. And again, um, while saying that, we've noted again that uh, in terms of environmental aspect, Nigeria produces quite a lot of high uh, waste, but at the same time, there are issues on the issue of land degradation. So question has been asked, what is the relationship between uh, waste management and land de degradation within the country? Is there a way we can marry the two um, together? Farming system, of course, I think this is quite popular, not just in Nigeria, is much more small holding, um, and the, these small holders farmers uh, they work on fragmented land use. So you have pocket of farmers at different places doing different things. This uh, um, affects the issue of coordination strongly in terms of production. Um, in current national policy uh, with the state policy, I mentioned earlier that um, we have this structure of federal system as you have here. But what you may find interesting is that while a, a policy is being made at the federal level, uh, so a, another policy that counters the federal policy <laughs> will be made at the state level. And you kept on wondering how the two uh, we, we work together. Um, so this is quite uh, strong. But not just at the states and the federal level alone, but even in terms of across the uh, value chain. Uh, you may have a policy today in terms of production that is very positive, that negates processing uh, uh, work. You know, so those are the issues that we encounter. And of course, low awareness on the issue of capa uh, and capacity on food system discourse. I think I can rightly say that uh, food system only became uh, an emerging issue in Nigeria sometimes uh, last year, if I'm very correct about that. And, and this uh, credit goes to A4NH work, you know, in Nigeria. Um, prior to that, I think, yes, it may be there, but it might probably be knowledge in different areas of food system rather than a cohesive food system approach. You know, so this is something that is very strong as well. In terms of opportunities, yes, the opportunities are there for food system to grow, but there's rich factors that are associated with all these opportunities as well. Nigeria has a high growing middle class. Um, um, close to around 20% of Nigeria now will be regarded as, as middle class. And that is quite a very strong um, opportunity for a food system. Um, and these middle class are conscious of nutritious food. They want to engage in getting food that has high level of nutrition. Um, in addition to that as well, there's a general increase in demand for convenience type of food. Um, the demand is not just uh, uh, coming from the middle class, it's also coming from the lower class as well, that are living in the urban area, okay? And uh, the factor that is affecting this as well is not just the people that are living in the urban area, but much more of women are also engaging in jobs outside the home, which means that there is a need to have 
a quick, uh, their time has to be well managed. And that leads to more of uh, engaging in having a con convenient food as well. So that um, 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 is creating that uh, issue of demand for uh, convenience food. Growing urbanization, I won't go into that. I think it's on record that Nigeria is one of the high uh, urbanized uh, country in the whole of Africa now. The urbanization is quite growing strongly. Um, but at the same time that the urbanization is growing, there is a renewed interest among some states in Nigeria, and this is specific to some states and region now, in terms of uh, rural development. But when you are engaging in rural development, uh, the, the dichotomy or, or, or paradox is that you might probably also be engaging in deforestation. So where does the two come together? How do you marry the two? Um, stronger involvement of private sector or even at the downstream. If we categorize the, uh, the value chain across the downstream, midstream, and upstream, uh, in the past, the focus of private sector has strongly been on the upstream, which is on, on the processing side. But now I think there is a, 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 a imagined uh, uh, understanding that private sector has to get engaged even at the production side as well, and that is growing um, uh, strongly. Um, retail food stores are growing in Nigeria. Um, Gradually, there's a change in shopping pattern from our usual open market to supermarkets in the urban area. I'm aware that uh, uh, ShopRite, which is a, a South African brand uh, for kind of a big supermarket, came to Nigeria some years ago with just around one or two. Now they have around 16, you know, all over um, 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 Nigeria and having their largest even the uh, supermarket in Nigeria across the whole of Africa. That is a, a, a sign of a growth of uh, uh, this kind of a, a food stores within the country. Agribusiness become a, a, a front burner. I think a lot of credit has to be given to President Adeshina, uh, kind of the AFDB president uh, who uh, uh, actually did a lot in terms of making agribusiness uh, to come to front burner within the, uh, the country. Um, from that going forward, it has become something that most of the states and areas want to engage in. So not just looking at agriculture from the technical perspective alone, but looking at it from the business and the management angle as well across the value chain. Of course, growing food processing that demand intermediate products. As bigger companies are growing, they also want to engage in interme intermediate products as well. So that's kind of a, a opportunity that exists for food system um, within the country. But as said earlier as well, they, those also have their risk factors. The dynamics in Nigeria in terms of food um, um, system, um, changing diet from natural to, to processed uh, food because of the growing middle class, because of the urbanization, but of course, the implication as well is, is the health effect. As earlier mentioned, you know, um, obesity rate in Nigeria now is, is quite uh, high. And I'm aware that statistically, the highest number of obesity uh, 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 prevalence is much in Lagos now, which of course is not far-fetched because of the high level of uh, urbanization and the, com the, the change in, in diet uh, to more of a convenience food that is probably not that healthy uh, within the area. Regulation and monitoring. Yes, there are a lot of regulation, but then how is this regulation being monitored? Um, I think many of us will have been aware that the Nigerian border is completely closed now for close to some months now uh, because they want to ensure that the regulation that they put in place in terms of rice importation, and not just rice importation, but some other importation remains. But uh, as this importation, as this uh, regulation were in place for many years, what they realize is that the volume of rice in Nigeria <laughs> keep on growing. So where is it coming from? Is it that we are the one farming it or producing it? But the reality is that it's coming from somewhere else. You know? So much more of a smuggling is going on. Why you put in place that kind of a regulation? So what happened between the two? You know? So those are the kind of the questions we ask in terms of dynamics within the country. Nigeria has a high preference for uh, foreign uh, 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 food um, in terms of uh, packaging and uh, compared to local food. But that is not people from the rural area, but much more, again, people from the urban area and, um, and the middle class. Commercial supply chain, especially for fruit and vegetable, is almost zero. Um, at this point in time, uh, focus has always been on cereal and many other crops, not on fruit and vegetable. So we don't currently have such a strong uh, a means of, uh, of getting a commercial supply chain for fruit and vegetable. An inadequate modern technology on all farm and all farm. Um, all farm storage is poor. I know a lot of policy has come in place in terms of building silos um, across Nigeria. And that has been done in the past. But the question that we have had is that, what goes into your silos? Um, when what you've produced on, on farm is not being uh, handled well, it's not being managed well. Um, so it's just gonna be garbage in, garbage out. So whatever has not been taken care of in terms of what is produced at, at, at on farm, we definitely not made any major impact as you put it in the silos. So that is becoming a major area of, um, um, of debate now. Inappropriate traditional processing facilities, and also um, farm to store 
transportation is a major issue. Um, one of the questions that people have asked me many times that I travel to different places with colleagues is that they will ask me, so how? How far is that your Lagos Ibadan Expressway? <laughs> and it remains to be an embarrassing question because this is something that has been going on for close to 16 years. One single road, I don't know how many kilometers, and that is by far the most important road in Nigeria for commercial products. So you can imagine what happened in other areas as well. Um, Multidimensional approach and actors on agro food chain is good to mention that um, if we have to look at, a, a, at the private sector engagement across micro enterprise, small and medium enterprise, and large companies, um, agro food chain, you know, uh, in Nigeria, uh, micro enterprise are rural dominated. Um, the multi sector coordination is very poor, coordination level um, is low, uh, members' participation is also low as well. Small and medium enterprise, they are much more common in peri urban, urban area. Um, they have coordination, but also very low. Um, but the large companies are mostly in urban area. Um, medium coordination, membership is very um, medium as well, and very high um, regulation takes place. Um, going forward, I don't want to dwell too much on that, but just for us to know that there are so many in innovations that we can get engaged into, um, more like inclusive business model that we can um, um, adopt, multi-sectoral approach to policy development and intervention, uh, innovation tech uh, should be encouraged at all, at all level, and rural infrastructure to support private sector engagement at downstream and midstream as well. An incentive for private se sector engagement will also be very good. Um, again, food system is about ecosystem of transferring healthier food from farm to the table. Many of you will be used to the first picture, the second picture, but the last one you may not be used to it. That's our local delicacy. Uh, it's uh, supposed to be very healthy, but this is disappearing much more now in the urban area. Thank you very much. Thank you, Debo. It's a large and complex country, but it is clear that if we want to change something in diets, that we cannot only look at the primary production. You haven't said anything about that. In fact, you have talked about the retail, about transport, about... And I think that's very much in line with the discussion on food systems. So now we proceed and gradually we go to until you, but first we have from some first-line reactions from uh, a panel. So may I invite uh, the three panel members, uh, Emmy Simmons, uh, who, is, uh, who was the former assistant uh, administrator from USAID. Uh, Stuart Gillespie from um, uh, IFPRI, working uh, on the program on, uh, 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 from uh, food systems, uh, from the uh, agriculture for nutrition and health, on one of the flagships, supporting policies, programs, and enabling action through research. Uh, and uh, Martin van Nieuwkoop, who is the global director of agriculture and food in the World Bank, but perhaps more importantly, he is a, he is a graduate from Wageningen University, <laughs> from my department. Uh, so I'm very pleased with you. We asked uh, the three of you to give a first reaction from the complex scheme you have seen to the more concrete examples, and you can also uh, uh, come up with your own uh, uh, additional expertise from your research. Emmy is particularly knowledgeable about Nigeria. She has been working on Nigeria for Globan. Stuart is knowledgeable about almost everything, but in this case, we <laughs> asked him to, uh, to comment a little bit more on the Asian, the Vietnamese case. And Mati van Nieuwkoop, we asked him to say a little bit more about what is the demand ac actually in many of the countries with uh, whom the World Bank is dealing in terms of food system transformation. So you have a few minutes, four or five minutes, just to comment and set the discussion, and then we go to the room. Emmy. First of you. Thank you, Ruth. Um, the reason I'm an expert on Nigeria is that 50 years ago I moved to Nigeria and I actually did village level work with a farming systems research team on household diets. So am I like the appropriate person here? I do want to thank our previous speakers, Inga, Debo, and, and Fong, for really very, very clearly telling us about transforming thinking about food systems and thinking and building food and agricultural systems based upon what those, what those ass assessments tell us. By starting with diets, we, we're, we're starting with the, I, the goal of nourishing the population rather than just feeding the population. And I think that's a distinction that a number of the CJIR centers have made as they've, as they've carried out their research, but I think Right now, we're seeing it looking forward as a much bigger challenge and a much more explicit challenge than we were even 10 years ago. I thought Inga's presentation of the sort of stages of transformation of food systems was very helpful. And 
and Debo and Chuang, Chuang both ban added, uh, Fuang, sorry, um, both added some detail about how those how those transformations are going and uh, confronting obstacles in Nigeria and, and Vietnam. But I would like to actually turn to the issue of risk, which I think, Debo, you kind of underplayed. <laughs> that one of the, you both talked about poverty and you talked about how low income groups has, still have a hard time getting adequate diets, being adequately nourished. The hunt, stunting numbers and the wasting numbers have gone down in Vietnam. I think they've actually also gone down, particularly in southern and southeastern Nigeria, southwestern Nigeria. But in many areas of the country, um, poverty still remains a major factor, especially in Nigeria, um, for, um, for achieving an adequate diet. The fact that in 2015, 2016, Nigeria's oil export revenues dropped by about 50% had an almost immediate impact on how the food system worked and the kinds of diets that people were able to achieve. But I think there are two other risks that I wanna just pay quick attention to. One is climate change, which I think is, is increasingly being perceived by many of us working in this field as a risk that we don't yet understand, that varies a lot by geography, and that is likely to be kind of unanticipated in some way. When is the next typhoon coming? When is the next flood coming? How, are the, what, how is drought going to occur? And this is the, the good thing about A4 and H being part of the CJIR family and having other people who are other research institutions who are already looking at this. The last kind of risk that I want to pay, draw attention to is one that I spent time in Nigeria last year looking at, which is the impact of violent conflict. Nigeria has three kinds of conflict, which two of which are incredibly violent and one of which might be or is likely to grow in violence. In northeast Nigeria, there are the Boko Haram and um, ISIS knockoffs uh, have actually ensured that Northeast Nigeria's total productivity in agriculture has dropped and poor nutrition and malnutrition has grown enormously. More than seven million people have been displaced from their homes and many of the people who were displaced were farming and part of that community production system. So the outcome in Nigeria of violent conflict especially to the herder, I didn't mention this, the herder farmer conflict has been important. But I think we're now beginning to realize that the scale of disruption and destruction and the impact on food, diets, and nutrition is a challenge that globally we need to take a lot more seriously. We've seen in the numbers that, that IFPRI has put out with regard to hunger show that in the last four years, the trends in undernutrition have begun to rise again, largely because of, of conflict, and something really must be done about it. The idea of integrating interventions in humanitarian assistance, development assistance, and peace building assistance kind of puts another whole spin, another whole layer of requirements on our understanding of food systems, figuring out how to intervene in food systems to make them more resilient, to make them more inclusive and to make them, make them contribute to um, the growth of a next generation that's capable cognitively and physically of actually proceeding. So with that, I could talk on, on for on and on, but I won't. I think there, that Debo, you talked about sort of opportunities for, um, for agriculture and for economic growth to, do, to contribute to solving food system obstacles. And I think that looking back at your chart would be an incredibly helpful way of kind of charting a positive way forward. But I do think we need to take those risks into account as we seek more resilient food systems. Thank you, Emma. That's very helpful because you put a little bit on the, 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 our attention on whether this framework is useful not only in ju just regular development settings, but also in more crisis situations. And, uh, I think that is uh, really useful for the discussion. Stuart. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm going to talk about nutrition in the context, obviously, of food system transformation. And I think now it 
requires us, if we do that or try to do that, to talk about malnutrition in all its forms, especially in the context of the climate crisis. And I will use that word crisis, I know we talked about that. Um, and if we do that, we start to focus in more explicitly on healthy diets, sustainable diets, which are pivotal both for undernutrition and for overweight and obesity. So they're the key area of focus uh, for, for what we should be for what we should be doing. Um, we, if we think in terms of transformation, transformation means change. It means radical change, and so actually it requires us to also understand a bit about change. And as part of that. Going back six years after we uh, had finished um, a couple of papers for the Lancet Nutrition Series, which was under nutrition focused, we decided we needed to somehow balance the evidence that we were accumulating on the what issues. What is the problem? What, what are the causes, consequences? What works in terms of interventions? With a more of a focus on the how questions, i.e., you know, how to make it happen in this multi sectoral arena. How do we? Uh, whoever we are, stakeholders, actually engage in this challenge uh, and, and turn it around. So knowledge requires us to understand evidence. It requires us to understand experience. So we focused in on an initiative called Stories of Change in a set of case study countries. And the idea was to address the how issue or try to understand the drivers. Some of that was done quantitatively using DHS uh, data sets and decomposition analyses. Some of it was done uh, qualitatively or mixed methods wh whereby we interviewed, I mean, hundreds of people from uh, national policymakers right down to gr uh, grassroots mothers and frontline uh, workers. So as we, and bringing that all together in a kind of triangulation to shine a light on, on the drivers of, ch of change in those, in those countries. And I won't go through the, de I don't have time to go through the, uh, the, the details. I will focus on Vietnam. Vietnam is a very interesting country, and, and we've heard that from Phuong, and Phuong has been involved in one of these stories, um, which we're now expanding, and I'll explain why. We started off by looking at undernutrition, and as Phuong said, showed the trends are positive in as much as the child stunting has dropped from 37 to 25% in a 14-year period, and through the work we did on the, on the quantitative analysis, we can see that poverty reduction was important, that women's education was particularly important, and also access to health services. Um, but on the other side, as with change and challenge are two very similar words, and the challenges that remain in Vietnam and, and elsewhere relate to equity, so if we look at that figure of currently, or 2014, 25% child stunting, if you look at by quintile, the richest quintile, the stunting, child stunting was 6%. The poorest quintile was 41%, big differences, uh, which we need to pay attention to, especially in the context of the SDGs. Second big challenge, the nutrition transition in, in Vietnam. Now around about 20% of women are overweight, um, and this is applying across, and this is going alongside urbanization and other, other drivers. But it applies across a lot of countries in Asia and increasingly Africa, the double burden of, uh, of malnutrition. And so we set apart a third wave of studies which we called stories of challenge and because we do not have yet um, positive experience of, of success, actually, when it comes to overweight and obesity. So we focused up on the upstream challenge, uh, on the upstream issue of how policymakers, programmers are grappling with that challenge of beginning to address these rapidly rising uh, rates of overweight uh, and obesity. And that relates to agenda setting, it relates to what drives political commitment, what drives policy traction. And we need to look at food, food systems, health systems, food environments, health environments, and we need to overlay that with the social, political, and economic kind of lenses. And ask questions about, are there drivers of success in undernutrition common to overweight and obesity? Are there trade-offs? Potentially, you could be in a situation where what's good for undernutrition may exacerbate or raise the risk of overweight and obesity, so we need to pay attention to that. So Vietnam is now going into a second stage of looking at that aspect, the nutrition transition, along with Indonesia, uh, Ghana, South Africa, and Brighton <laughs> in the UK, <laughs> which is where I live. By coincidence, um, I guess. a mini case study. <laughs> We're not spending a lot of A4 and H money on. Um, and another big part of this challenge is, all, uh, is stakeholder engagement. And obviously, the private sector, or certain parts of the private sector, i.e. big food, 
are driving a large part of the problem of overweight and obesity. So that is another issue politically we need to address in, in some form. So just to finish by saying we have a whole set of these case studies available, more coming uh, available next year, uh, and we'll be bringing them out in various forms. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stuart. And I have to acknowledge these stories are really interesting because they, they do illustrate the dilemmas we are facing. If you are making gains in some areas, you might be losing in other areas, and particularly the new understanding on how undernutrition, in a way, is also related in the second life, life cycle of families to, towards overweight. That is really making the challenge far more complex. Now, Martin, you are more in the policy uh, and practice side. If you find these schedules perhaps a little bit complicated, but in your daily life, what can you share with us about uh, uh, the demand that countries present to you? Okay. Thanks, Ruth, and, and very happy to, to be here. And indeed, in my daily life as global director, I interact with a lot of our clients um, across the world. And, and you know, one of the questions I want to kind of reflect upon a little bit is, you know, how do client counties see food system transformation? Um, and I think there, you know, I don't think there's a kind of a common understanding or vision what is meant by food system transformation. And actually, I have to admit, also, I think in the presentations that we saw today, people talk about, some of the presenters talk about food system transformation, and we'll talk about food system transition. And I think there's a big difference between the two. It was already mentioned uh, by the previous speaker, uh, transformation kind of implies radical, uh, a radical change. Now, in order to go to radical change, if you want to take food system transformation seriously, I think um, counties need to realize, I mean, the hidden cost of the food system and the scope and the seriousness of that. And I think, in general, I mean, policymakers don't realize that. I mean, we've done some calculations on that, on the hidden cost of the global food system, looking at undernourishment, hunger, obesity, overweight, loss of biodiversity, greenhouse gas emissions from the global food system, uh, food loss and waste. I mean, you can go on and on, and we put a number of that on that, and our estimate is about $6 trillion um, per year which relates to $8 trillion of the value added of the global food system. So there's no real recognition that the current food system in many countries is broken. And, 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 and a second uh, observation here is there's also not sufficient recognition that the government's own policies actually contribute, I mean, to that broken food system. If you look at the public support, I mean, to global food systems across the world, according to the best estimates we have, it's about $600 billion a year, and very little, I mean, about 50% goes to public good. The rest is, is, is all kind of expenditures and support that is highly distortionary um, and being part of the problem. I think those two conditions need to be fulfilled in order to kind of uh, move forward on transformation in terms of radical change. Now, when it comes to the specific demands and the concerns uh, that clients have, I mean, the demands typically also cover just one part of the food system, either a segment, you know, in the value chains, production, post-harvest value addition, or it's actually focused on one of the drivers, you know, the specific demand for technology or infrastructure or for uh, policies. Uh, also, big concerns about the political e economy. So if you want to make transformative change, how do we then deal with the political economy? Ministers of Agriculture are struggling uh, with that. And then also, um, the kind of the planning horizon. I mean, our clients, I mean, are in the office, I mean, only, you know, relatively short term, when you compare it to the kind of the, 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 the time that is needed to kind of pull off those system changes. So this, it's very often in the conversations, okay, what are the quick wins here? And the quick wins are not necessarily the kind of things that drive, I mean, uh, transformative um, uh, change. Um, now, what are some of the gaps that need to be addressed um, to, to move forward on, um, on, 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 on food system transformation? Um, you know, one is, I mean, one consideration I want to put forward here is, you know, a healthy, a sustainable diet within planetary boundaries, I mean, has been defined, put forward by the EAT, um, you know, by the, by the Landsat Commission. The thing is, if you calculate, I mean, the cost of that diet, you know, in the World Bank, I mean, our mission is to alleviate absolute poverty. The poverty line is, is the international poverty line is $1.9 a day. Um, this diet costs about 
$2.80, $2.90. Um, there are about 750 million people who are poor, according to our estimates, uh, poor in the world. About 1.6 billion people can actually not afford, I mean, this healthy diet. So how do we square that? Uh, so I want to put that uh, forward there. Uh, food system transformation, of course, is a very inter-institutional, multidisciplinary kind of approach. So, so and typically, also on our client side, um, that coordination doesn't necessarily, uh, you know, exist. When I engage with the ministers of agriculture, I mean, typically the conversations tend to focus on certain segments of the value chain and certain drivers. And then finally, the third um, um, reflection, um, and I didn't hear that coming through, is the private sector. Uh, the private sector has a major role to play. Um, the, uh, we will see significant growth in the post-harvest value addition. I mean, the ratios on farm, off farm in Africa is about one to one. In, in the United States, Europe, it's one to eight, one to 10. So a lot of growth will happen there, also driven by urbanization. So what is the role that the private sector can play in terms of carrots and sticks? Uh, with the food price crisis 10 years ago, 12 years ago, there was a lot of discussion about the principles of responsible agriculture investments, focusing on the kind of the local uh, effects of those investments, but what responsibilities do the private sector actually have when it comes to responsible agricultural marketing? Because those have a very big influence when it comes to uh, dietary outcomes. Uh, and I think that is an important uh, part of the equation as well. Yeah. Thank you, Martin. I think you, uh, you are pointing and asking our attention uh, for not only who is doing the, the job, the public and the private sector, but, but one thing I think that is very much on, on our minds always, that if you invest in a better diet, the, the payback is not always in the agricultural sector, but sometimes it's in the cost of the health sector. And, uh, and they are not always about the table. Please, uh, uh, for the other members of the member, keep in mind this question about the private sector, because I will come back to you with that question uh, later on. I think it's a very relevant question. Uh, but first, I want to go to the audience and, uh, and recollect a couple of questions. Not so much, let's say, you have a question, the panel will answer, because this is a common search, I think, on how we can progress in this food system thinking application. So if you have your own experience or your own ideas, please feel free to share that with us. And, and please introduce yourself, your name and your affiliation, and then uh, we will distribute later on the questions. If you have somebody in mind, you can, uh, you can direct your question directly to somebody. Here we have the first one. You have a microphone. Yeah, Larry Schaefer, Schaefer Global Management. Um, indoor agriculture, aquaponics, hydroponics. What's the appetite for investors? What's the appetite for the large funding agencies, the World Bank, the UN, even within countries like Nigeria? Um, what's the, I know Asia is big on a lot of indoor agriculture production systems. But how can we bridge that gap and bring this not only just to urban, to peri-urban, but also the rural folks as well and tie in then energy to the whole complex scheme? Thanks very much. Relevant question. To be honest, in the Netherlands we are trying, but it's sometimes even a little bit too expensive for us even. But let's go over there. We have one question more and then... Yeah, thank you, Ruud. Uh, Ian Wright from, from Ilry. I, I want to pick up on Martin's point about the private sector, and of course the private sector is very heterogeneous. We talk about private sector, and we tend to think about the big multinationals, Nestle and Mars. And Unilever. But the reality is it's the small and medium-scale enterprises that are driving change, particularly in Africa. And the recent AGRA report written by Tom Reardon, and Tom's been making this point for some time, it's that small and medium-sized uh, enterprises that are driving things. But that makes it very difficult to reach the private sector because you're talking about a multitude, thousands, millions of small businesses. And I struggle to know, how do we begin to interact with that hidden middle? Because it's a real challenge. And I, I would be interested in the panel's kind of views on how do we reach them. Thanks. And then we have another question here in front. If we have a microphone here. Thank you, Rob Foss, uh, if we um, would like to reinforce the last point, also the point my team made. I was a bit surprised that the private sector came up sort of as an afterthought. I was going to make the same point, also being co-author of that uh, uh, Africa Aerial Status uh, uh, report uh, on the hidden middle. It's, it's the private sector also in everywhere, not just in Africa. 
that's driving these changes. So we should think about, well, what are we not doing in terms of steering <laughs> private sector action? So maybe one thing to, to think about what the panel thinks about the role of, uh, of things, what, uh, at least in my conversation with the private sector, what they like governments to do is to help them coordinate and improve setting food standards. So a lot of private businesses, supermarkets, uh, processing companies, they set the standards as part of their branding, and uh, but also um, to to ensure to the consumers what the quality of their product is, but in certain ways. And a lot of private sector agents, uh, they're asking, well, we need a lot more coordination of these standards so they become more credible. Uh, credible. So. What what would you see as, as a way for food standards, uh, not just safety but also the quality of food, as a way forward yeah. to change the food system? Thanks very much. Let let me start. Let me let's start with the countries now, and then go back to the uh, to the more general framework. So I I, I would like to either Debo or uh, Tren, who would like to start, Juan. Yeah, I think it's unfortunate that um, the second to the last slide, I wasn't able to. Uh, uh, talk about it properly. It was um, focused primarily on private sector engagement. And um, what we have seen, and it's rightly been mentioned here, is that those that engage strongly on, on the food um, value chain in Nigeria are the small and medium enterprises. Um, um, but their engagement is not much more in the area of production has been mentioned, but at the meat uh, level of uh, processing. Uh, but the question that has been raised is that for them to continue to engage, you know, in that area, what kind of an incentive is there for them? An incentive in this manner is not necessarily financial, you know, um, is their, their kind of um, uh, incentive in terms of infrastructure development by the government to induce them to engage much more in the areas where they, they are. Um, we, we hear from quite a number of uh, small and medium enterprises in Nigeria mentioning that even the government policy is not favorable for them to thrive you know, within the country. Um, it, 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 you're talking about the issue of energy, what about the cost in terms of production? You know, if the energy cost is that high for them, how are they gonna break even in their business? So those kind of questions um, come to mind. But as, aside that as well, I think um, one of the things that is also gonna be essential for most of the private sectors is at the SME level to drive is the issue of innovation. You know, who we'll help them, who we'll support them in terms of innovation, you know, on, on area of um, um, agriculture. That that would be very, very essential and important. And I think um, um, oh, uh, another uh, um, point that was raised in terms of uh, um, the large company as well, what kind of a relationship exists between the large company and the SME? You know, um, are they uh, are providing the right kind of a, um, uh, impetus for, for those SME to engage with the large companies? Those kind of questions are still strongly there. Um, or are they crowding the SMEs in the different places where they are? Um, well, th those, those are questions that, that still require answers. Thank you. But Fung, perhaps you can go because you are also a nutritionist. So what do we know in your country about how private sector, small or or medium size, how do they deliver, deliver in terms of improving of nutritional outcomes? Eh? Because that they can improve efficiency, that's very well understood, I think. But we don't know yet how that works in terms of a food system transformation. Could you eliminate us a little bit more on that? Yeah, uh, thank you. So in terms, I think that's a very important point that you mentioned about small and medium uh, enterprise. Because in case of Vietnam, the in medium or the big one need to register with the government and under the control with different standards of safety and everything. But the small one, normally they are exempted. If they are at certain level small, and then that one is a big one that can cause a problem because they d may not meet the standards, they may not follow all the regular regulation and all the things. Uh, the second point here is so in Vietnam, it's very government control, but each people have a different expertise. They, in the current that Stuart mentioned that we conducted the story of challenge, when we ask people like, why is the obesity or um, overweight, or what is the issue, who's in charge of that? Everyone say that it's the role of Ministry of Health. And we say, who else? They say, mainly Ministry of Health. 
but also importing or exporting is the Ministry of Industry and Trade. So if they import a lot of like sugar beverage and all kind of thing, they don't think it have an effect later on on the health. They only know that Ministry of Health is the one who in charge and people who need to be responsible for whatever they consume. And if we say, what else do you think? And they say, okay, maybe education because uh, they need to educate the children or they educate people. So there's a lot of disconnect between the different segments, different ministries that there. And then then the um, kind of the enterprise, they normally they work with the industry and trade. They don't work with health. So they also don't pay attention to what is the benefit or the the adverse effect on health. Thank you. Inga, in the framework that you presented, that was rather complex, in fact, but uh, we have seen it concrete, but where were, where was the, what, what, what's the role that private sector plays in that uh, particular framework? Yeah, I think the private sector is extremely important in the framework, actually in all components, but it's also heterogeneous. Um, I, have to, I have to say actually two things on this. Um, since the beginning, we are trying to involve the private sector you know, as, a, as an umbrella concept in our program, but we have not been very successful um, up till now. One of the most important things is that we as scientists, we like to talk about the problem. And as we did here, we add on and add on, and we have to think about this, and we have to think about that. That's not something private sector is interested about. They want to talk about solutions, and I think our question to the private sector is not yet specific enough. So um, I think we have to work on that. Second, yes, private sector, but we have also to talk about consumers. Um, nobody's talking about the consumers. If we have meetings in our countries, it's very difficult to find representatives of consumers. Um, and I think we have to, to also listen uh, to their voice uh, uh, besides private sector. Thanks very much. I don't know, Inge, uh, Emmy, you wanted to comment? And then we go back to the floor. I just wanted to make quick comment on the question about sort of new technologies, aquaponics, um, using vertical vegetable farms and that sort of thing. Because when a colleague and I were in Nigeria last year, we were looking at the challenges of Stories of Challenge in a conflict zone and responding to the fact that the um, humanitarian community was largely delivering staples, you know, cereals, grains, CSB, and that people were having a terrible time in getting fruits and vegetables. Well, the private sector was actually asking for two things that we talked to. They were asking for security on the roads so that they could actually take their trucks through the areas that were sort of under, under Boko Haram control and actually get fruits and vegetables to, for example, the town of Maiduguri, which has almost three million people living in it now. We, but we asked other people, we said, well, who is doing, who is introducing urban agriculture, um, you know, growth of vegetables and fruits in non-soil. Everybody says, oh my gosh, that's way too difficult. But of course, the government has prohibited, and you know this, Debo, they prohibited traders from taking fertilizer into that area because it can be used to make bombs. So the farmers are suffering on one hand. The innovations that you might think would be useful from a nutritional perspective, also intensively growing um, uh, fish in, in, what do you call it, in tanks, and growing uh, in much more intensive production of, of poultry, for example. Again, filling out that dietary need. It's just, it's hard, you know, to get that conversation going and to sort of figure out how to do it. A number of NGOs are starting to, to sort of pursue that conversation, but I think the, the recommendation that we came up with is in why I, I talked about risk is that, in fact, the government may need to look at explicitly at de-risking in a more intentional way in order to allow those that kind of transformation of diet, not transformation of food system, but transformation of diet to happen in that conflict-affected region and to address the real nutritional deficiencies which are there. Thanks, Amy. Last comment on this round, Martin. Yes, uh, thanks, I mean, for, for the question. I think they hang together a little bit uh, because, you know, in 2050, according to the data I have, I mean, 70% of the food consumers will live in urban areas. And I think when we talk about 
food system transformation, going back to what Inge presented, I think the transformation will be how can we leapfrog from the mixed food system to the future food system and actually skip this kind of urban uh, food system. And in, th and in that sense, it's quite interesting and revealing that you know, in the discussions um, about green cities, I mean, how do you actually bring in a food system perspective in that? Because typically that's not included in urban planning. And I think when we include that, I mean, then we can actually have a discussion, you know, on what, how, how indoor, I mean, agriculture can play a role. I think it will play an important role because it connects the producers with the consumers in those settings. Um, most of the value addition of the uh, small and medium enterprises uh, will take place with a view, I mean, uh, meeting the demand of the consumers in the urban areas. How do you reach them? I think it's it's incentives. I mean, think about sugar tax or all the kind of, uh, as well as the, uh, the standards and the regulations. And of course, in most countries right now, I mean, so food safety systems are not existent or, or broken. I think there's a lot of work to be done uh, by the public sector there as well. Uh, so if there would, for me, if there would be a significant demand, I mean, going back to the clients, about, I mean, creating the conditions for food system transformation, I mean, food safety would be very high on my list. Thanks. And this brings us a little bit to the complication, how to mix different types of incentives for reaching, let's say, not only one goal, but different goals. Let's go to, first of all, I want to see on the, uh, from the online audience. Okay, uh, so we have several questions here. This question is for Fuang from Masrasha Tasema, Director of Food Science and Nutrition Research Directorate at the Ethiopian Public Health Institute. What is the food transformation from rural slash tradition to urban? If so, how long did it take to transform? How is the food system and national nutrition coordination systems in Vietnam? Do you think governance played a key role in transformation? And this one is uh, also from West Russia, but for Inge. How would you think that Nigeria meets the future food system that Inge presented? Do you have a national plan of action for the problem you mentioned? And then this one is Victor Kamaral from Simit. Are there any major changes in staples consumption, such as in Bangladesh or other urban countries, where wheat-based product demand is going up? And uh, this one is from Ramesh, CEO of the India Agriculture Group International. There are three issues. The first is household incomes versus food affordability in Vietnam and Nigeria. Second, strategies for building nutrition awareness. And thir uh, third, children below 12 are most vulnerable. Are there any programs for these groups? And the last one is from Ogun Dayomi Uluwani Sola, a project partner at Cedar Strip Company, Agritech Business Division Plat. Plantation Farms Unit, Nigeria. And this is for Debo. What effort are we making to develop a community-supported agriculture type of food system in Nigeria? I understand the complexity of our system, but what can we do about this? Thank you. Very much. Keep the questions in mind, for, uh, then, because I will still take a few from the room. Over there. One, two, and three. That's all. Uh, my name is Mary from Kenya. I have a My name is Mary from Kenya. Um, my comment is not a question, but uh, it's a comment regarding the fact that despite transport and everything else, the food must be eaten by somebody. The communities, the socialization, the changes happening in countries in terms of what is defined as food. And some, in some contexts, we are still very traditional, what we eat, since I came here, I can say I have not eaten because I have not eaten Ugali. Um, and some people here can relate to that. But what we can transport food, we can send nutritious food, but unless we begin to talk to people about what they believe is food, we shall just be doing systems, putting systems in place that don't result into consumption. Secondly, the middle class, and I'm glad that um, uh, my brother mentioned it, in in Kenya, 40% of women in Nairobi are obese or overweight. In South Africa, it's higher. In Nigeria, it's higher. Tanzania is increasing. And what do middle class define as food? Uh, it's highly McDonaldized. Um, when KFC opened in one branch in Nairobi, we had traffic jam to midnight. 
comp we couldn't move on the road. So the influence of social media, the influence of the media, unless we bring that conversation into this conversation, we shall be talking to ourselves at a scientific level. But we need to be practical in terms of what's influencing what food is consumed where. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that's very useful to bring, let's say, day, uh, daily practice a little bit on the table. We have one more question here. Thank you, Ruard. Um, my comment is um, uh, based on the two observations. One, national systems do not understand what we are talking about in terms of, uh, when you walk into the Ministry of Agriculture, Martin, you ask, what is this food system approach to nutrition? And they look at you like, what, <laughs> right? So that's something that we have to keep in mind. It's not yet gone to the national systems yet, okay? We'll come back to that. But also, what are the solutions? So we took two country case studies, since we are sharing knowledge, uh, Myanmar and Afghanistan. We said, what can we do at the national level to take this food systems approach into the national system in terms of changing their strategies, policies, review that and see if this food system approach really mean anything to their s policies that are on the ground. And if there is some interest, is there investment that follows, right? They have the national budgets. So how much is that budget is related to the issues that we are talking about in terms of, uh, and that two exercises we have, we have just finished and, and discussion papers are coming out. I just want to share that. And that really helps us to look at the policy processes that we need to change in terms of thinking and institutional architecture that has to change in this. Bringing, uh, try to bring these five, five key ministries involved in food system in one place and talk to them. We did that in the last two years. It's very difficult, but they are coming together because they see common problems they have to address, right? Food standards is one of them, to just uh, uh, give There's an example. question. And <laughs> no, I have no question. <laughs> the third the issue that I want to raise in terms of solution is youth is going to be a huge solution for transforming food system. Entrepreneurs that are coming out, Emmy Simmons talk ab talked about Nigeria, there are a lot of youth entrepreneurs coming in Nigeria and talk about surrounding Ibadan. There is so many people growing fish and, and, and uh, you know. Uh, so how do we capture that human capital for this purpose of transforming food system? Thank you. That's a clear question. The last, but you have half a minute to uh, put your question. Sure. Um, uh, my name is Quinn. I'm a nutrition PhD student at Johns Hopkins University. Um, just looking at high income countries like the US and maybe some lessons that could be learned um, there's a toolkit of, you know, opportunities that we have to try to maintain healthy diets in the face of food systems transformations, and some of them are more palatable now in, in the U.S. You know, you can do education campaigns. You might be able to tweak the nutrition labels on foods, but then there are some that are just completely entrenched, almost taboo topics now, like taxing unhealthy foods and to a certain extent even making our safety net programs, you know, better quality, like SNAP. You know, there might be small initiatives like double up bucks to incentivize vegetable purchases, but on the whole we're not looking to increase the value of SNAP allotments. We're trying to, you know, almost dissuade people from using SNAP. Um, so I'm just wondering, is the window of opportunity in uh, countries like Vietnam and Nigeria you know, is that still open to consider the full range of the toolkit, or is is it already taboo there as that's, well? That's an excellent question, and I, I can, in fact, ask also in the last round to each of the panel members. You only have a, a, a minute or minute and a half, but if you have heard now the type of question, what are the entry points for making food systems move? Eh? And not entry points because you believe that, but talking and thinking on, on, on Stuart's work, what is what's the evidence base? What do we know? Perhaps we don't know, then we have to do more research. But if we know, then we can go to the action. Emmy, can you start? <laughs> <laughs> we're not, we're not going to have these other guys answer about the questions about you Nigeria and Vietnam. <laughs> okay. I can just make one point. Is it, it seems to me that, again, you, you know, I'm always sort of humbled, because I think everybody thinks like this. Everybody thinks with a food systems perspective and understands that improving the quality of diets is like job number one, right? And But I hear people talking and saying, no, this isn't, this isn't the, the sort of the norm yet. My only last comment would be to, to challenge Martin a bit. 
I think that, in fact, transformation of food systems is not necessarily radical, but I think it must be intentional. So when I look at and look at sort of the assessments that people are making, I'm saying where is the commitment, where is the, the incentive for people to make different choices, at, from policymaker to consumer to trucker to processor? Where are the incentives to do that? Because I think this dynamic of the food system really provides a challenge to us all. Hewitt. Thanks. I missed the last round, so I'm going to. Uh, I have various things to say about um, how many minutes? Uh, <laughs> private sector. But I will just focus on four things. One, it was really great to have SMEs mention small and medium enterprises because there's so much simplicity, oversimplicity about talking about private sector, a lot of cliches of whether it's part of the problem, part of the solution part of the solution. And I think we focus on, on the hidden middle, as you said, Ian. I think that's really important, and, and understanding how to incentivize towards healthy diets. Another key issue, which was mentioned by Ingo, is consumers and, and how to uh, generate and activate consumer demand for healthy diets. There's a great example of what happened in Mexico uh, with civil society supported by Bloomberg Philanthropies. Uh, it's all m described in the Lancet Syndemic Commission report. And those are the kind of examples that we tend to we tend to be a bit too top-down. Uh, having said that, taxes are important. <laughs> uh, um, regulation does work. Uh, sugar taxes do work. We see in Mexico, Chile, uh, UK. Uh, they're doing it in Malaysia, Thailand, I think France, Portugal. So, you know, that is a part of that one tool in the arsenal. It works. We've, and there is now a move towards uh, possible junk food taxes on confectionery and, and other uh, unhealthy aspects of diet. And the last thing, I totally agree with um, Suresh on, on youth. We need to shine a light on youth and try to incentivize youth to get, to, uh, get involved in transformations. Excellent. Thanks. Debo. Yeah, I think I would you just can't answer all your questions. No, I'm, I'm not. I'm, I'm just, brothers, I'm just you, can, you can send them an answer back by me. No, that's right. fine. I'm just building on what is just finished with, because what I have here is about the youth. You know, I think for me that is going to be a game changer. Um, if we look at Nigerian um, um, a specific context, you know, the uh, high level of um, young people um, um, we have in terms of population. And they are not just, I kept on saying that it's not just about youth for me, it's about young leaders. You know, if we can identify those that are young leaders among the youth, you know, that are engaging in entrepreneurship that has to do with agriculture, and there's quite a lot of them truly. Um, uh, even in the urban area that are engaging in urban agriculture, you know, that we can uh, probably walk towards um, uh, becoming uh, um, leaders in SMEs. You know, I think that is going to be a major game changer for us in terms of food system in Nigeria, considering that the generation in terms of production for us in Nigeria are, are between, be, be aging you know, between the age of 60 to 70 now. Yeah. I think that that will be a major game changer yeah. for us in the country. Thank you. I understand, especially if you have a young population, that's a good investment. Inge. Yeah, it's always nice uh, to talk about game changer and to think about one solutions for all, but they don't exist. Um, I think, I mean, I, I could um, uh, say also that youth is very important. Uh, we see that already in climate change, um, that the youth is protesting and it makes a lot of um, uh, impact actually uh, on us. Um, so I think it's really important to empower the ends of the food system, which are the farmers and the consumers. Now they get all the blames. Uh, they produce not uh, sustainable, uh, sustainable enough or they do not consume healthy and sustainable enough. And the middle is silent. So I think we have to empower these two ends um, to actually uh, require their rights. Um, so it, it, it's more a movement, um, I would say. I would leave it like that. It's a nice analogy because we have the hidden middle and now we have the end. So we have to, <laughs> <laughs> we have to use yes. the hidden middle to make the ends work. Yeah, the Martin. Yeah, I, I said before, you know, so if you talk about the transformation or transition, I think what you want to avoid being in the urban food system. Um, and uh, so I think that would be the entry point. I mean, what can be done to avoid getting in a situation that is depicted by an urban food system? Um, there has been talk about the consumer's voice lacking. It's kind of interesting, you know. Uh, I think if you look at some uh, some surveys that have been done in Vietnam and as well as in China, what I've seen, where actually where the bank also is engaging on food safety, um, it is a major concern of consumers. Um, I remember once I, I was in Bangladesh with the whole management team of the World Bank, and 
of course, uh, kind of security situations. In, in, and so there was a briefing by the, our security expert, the World Bank office. So he went to the whole range of security to risk that he faced. At some point, he put a, a picture of a wet market with fruit and vegetables, etc. He said, "Don't go there. Don't buy there." So, you know, so 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 if you get to that point. Um, you know, never waste a good crisis. Uh, I think then you get the conditions also for transformative change. And I think food safety is then a good antidote that, that that can be a catalyst for many other changes. And of, and of course, clearly also, um, it is an area where there's a real role for the public sector to play. So, Fong, final. So um, I just want to make two points. The first one is I totally agree with the national system because it's very important for different stakeholders that really understand the issue and put all on the table because currently we have three types of different stakeholders, the agriculture, the trade, and then the health. But when we ask them like what policy, when you develop the policy, do you consider anything about nutrition? Or do you, when you develop policy on nutrition, is a trade element or agriculture affect anything? And very little connect there. There's a lot of disconnect. So that's something that the national system is very important. The second point are related to the rural urban transformation or urbanization. So basically, most of the things urban people eat, even the little, uh, middle or the high income, are the food produced from rural. The poor people produce that. But if we don't have the system to incentivize, incentivize them, that will be difficult because there's a lot of problem right now that they either produce very little or very much. And if they produce a lot, the price become little. And because of storage system or the cold chain is not good there, the food is wet. So we need to have, so I think Vietnam need to have something like to make them more sustainable or maybe subsidize for them or some way because whatever they produce, the urban people eat, and then it's important. Yeah. Thank you very much. Let me thank the panel, uh, which big applause, please, because I think they have done an excellent job. <laughs> and, and ask John McDermott, who is the director of the Agriculture for Nutrition and Health program, to, uh, I don't ask you to make a summary, but uh, yeah. what do you take up? and? Take forward. And um, on the intentional side, there's a few things that countries struggle with. And, um, you know, food system change is happening. Some of it's radical, but it's not very organized. And uh, I think Fong and Debo both kind of showed that. But where are they struggling? So one of it is to pull together these key outcomes, inclusion, sustainability, and health. And they're hard to put together. I think Martin made a very good point about the valuation problem. And then how do we, because it's hard to talk about trade-offs or anything without really valuing things properly. The second thing is they're not really thinking very much about the demand side. Uh, and uh, so the, we heard a lot of things about food environment and consumers um, that need to come up. And obviously, the private sector is connecting all these things. But where I see countries really struggling and the countries we're working with are on the transitions. So they're, it's hard to make these transitions. So they have everything set up for food security and cereal production. And then that interferes with diet diversity and changing things. So these transitions are really hard for people and hard for countries to plan. Um, so, so what's kind of important here, I think? So one is to recognize that we're going to make mistakes, but we need to accelerate the learning. And there's a lot of, and using systematic approaches getting more analytical about it, but also talking to people, bringing the different actors together. This kind of coordination alignment issue is very, very important. 
Um, because if we don't bring everyone with us, we can't just ban wet markets in Vietnam now because we're not going to bring the populace with us. So we've got to bring people together with us in these food systems. Um, and the nice thing is that this is something that everybody's vitally interested in. So we need to get moving on these solutions. And, and uh, I appreciate the kind of efforts that people have made to look at this. We covered a lot of ground in this, but it's a huge topic. So thanks very much for this introduction. It's something we're vitally interested in. And, and we're glad that so many people are here to join us in the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, John. And thank all of you for your presence and for your participation. If you still want to talk, we will be here still around for a, a couple of minutes. Let me just also thank the A4NH team that organized uh, this meeting. Janet Odu, I don't know where you are, but you have done an enormous work in making publicity for all of this. And put your attention on uh, uh, the uh, launch, probably in January, of what we call a food systems resource center. There you can find much information and tools on how to work with this uh, type of analysis. Uh, and we welcome also your comments and your ideas on that. So thanks very much, and uh, we keep in contact. <laughs>